every railway reopening, every railway project has exceeded expectations. I've no doubt that the Borders Railway will exceed expectations as well. Indeed, the ante has been raised. Uh, the former First Minister, Alex Salmond, said he expected, what was it, seven figures, a million people to use the, the line. You know, that's a, a lot of people using this railway. And the railways, they, they generate the traffic. They, they open up opportunities which are lying there latent. And uh, I don't think all these opportunities are taken into account in the... Uh, the raw business case to which this railway and others have been built. We know that the uh, the original specification did did call for rather more double track than has been installed, and we'd still like to see that double track installed at some point in the future. Um, the campaign is concerned. You know, I really hope we're proved wrong. I really hope that every train runs faultlessly and every train runs on time, and that everyone gets where they want to go when they want to get there. But, you know, we live in the real world and things do go wrong occasionally. And it's going to be tight. It's going to be really tight if, uh, if there are, you know, disruptions to the service, be that a breakdown or whatever. Um, and I would not like to see that detract from the experience that, that um, you know, that passengers on this line will have. The campaign walks this tightrope between being, you know, concerned advocates and being you know, probably the most critical friends of the line. Um, and on the one hand, we want to see the best possible line built. On the other hand, we want to see as many people as possible use the line and get a good experience from using that. And there's a whole raft of reasons why that's the case. We would like to see more infrastructure that would alleviate a lot of fears. I appreciate that there isn't a bottomless pit of money, okay, but uh, nevertheless, you know, the railway is being built to a budget and, you know, I just wish that more could be installed right now because I think it will be very expensive to install it at a later date. There's no reason, of course, why a well-engineered railway shouldn't be people-friendly. In fact, that's, you know, that's probably part of the, uh, the, the, uh, the designed infrastructure that's uh, built in to be as people-friendly as possible. But I, I must admit, I do get the impression sometimes that the railway is being well-engineered for engineers and that engineers think it's a, a great railway. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a great experience for the people who use the railway. If, you know, engineers say, well, if there's a delay, we'll take the flak for that. OK, that's, that's fine in engineering terms, but that doesn't give a good experience to someone who's stuck on a train not knowing when they're going to get home and see their kids. You know. And I know that that's been expressed you know, in public forum before, and I really wouldn't condone that sort of attitude or that sort of um, attitude towards the line. To get this level of investment, a transformational project, and just to start too, I mean, people um, should see this as the beginning of something, not the end as the trains start coming down. No, it's beginning and a real chance for us to get more people and more investment into the region and build on this first line. Fantastic opportunities available. Yeah, huge opportunities. I mean, if you think about it, if you're a, <coughs> excuse me, a tourist coming into Edinburgh, um, what better to do than to come down to the beautiful borders, the home of knitwear with all our fantastic food products um, with great people, especially on a steam train, come down you'll be able to see the national tapestry, go and explore the borders from here, but also for business. I mean this, this is not just for tourists nor is it for just for commuters. What we're doing is getting an environment that's going to attract more business which gets us better jobs and it enables us to raise the standard of living in the borders. And to be fair, of course, the SNP have always been behind it. Alex Salmond has been like a little kid in the toy shop. Uh, well, do you know, I, the number of times he's spoken uh, about this when I've been with him, he's so passionate about it. And, uh, you know, one of his last um, things he did before he stood down as First Minister was get the package of funding, the millions of pounds, around the railway that brings all the different agencies together to make sure it is a success. Because it's not just a case of if you build it, they will come. You absolutely have to take this as just the first step in a journey to improve in the local economy. Now, Hoyk, of course, a lot of people wanting that uh, uh, to be very much part of the Borders Railway uh, in a few years' time. We obviously know things don't happen overnight. But what is the process for that? Because that's something which you will no doubt be pushing for. Yeah, it's, it has to happen. I, you know, I, this, that's why I say this is just the beginning. 
beginning. You know, even that, I mean that from a transport perspective too. So we need to get it on to Hoyk and through to Carlisle. And, and for me as a, an MP um, down in Westminster, what a fantastic project for the UK government to get behind, for MPs in the north of England to get behind. And how quickly, realistically, can, can we see this happening? I, I don't know. You probably know better than me. But um, these things, you're right, they don't happen overnight. But what I don't want is a, a mentality of let's wait and see how successful this railway line is before we do anything else. No, let's not wait because we know it's going to take years. You do a feasibility study, then you've got to identify the funds and then plan out the project and it will take some time to put back in place. So let's not wait is my attitude. I think we need to demand it as soon as possible. We need to get the money set aside as soon as possible. Uh, and then, you know, let's, let's accelerate whatever timeline we've, we're presented with. I think we're going to see nothing less than a transport transformation. If you're somebody who uses the X95 bus from Gala to Edinburgh at the moment, it's taking you 83 minutes. The train's going to take as little as 50 minutes. It'll be much more comfortable. There'll be toilets, room to get up and stretch your legs. What a great way to get into town on the train. So that will be a transformation. And, uh, you know, we've had this situation that since 1969, public transport from the borders to Edinburgh has been slower than it was in 1910. Well, finally, that's going to be ended. The other part of the dimension, of course, is people who currently drive into Edinburgh. And Tweed Bank, if we're talking about the borders, Tweed Bank will be the primary park and ride uh, station for people who want to leave their cars behind. Um, in the peak hours, 54 to 60 minutes from Tweed Bank right to the centre of Edinburgh will be very attractive to motorists, so a lot to be attracted by there. Perhaps a bit less so in the, the off-peak hours when roads are not so congested. And that's one of the concerns about the fact that the consultants never looked at an express service from the borders. They looked at a, a service which basically stopped at every station, rather than an express service, only stopping a few places in Midlothian and Edinburgh, and a separate inner suburban service from Gorebridge. They didn't look at that, we don't know why they didn't look at it, and that was a loss. However, when all said and done, it, it will be a, a transport transformation. But of course, if you look back to the origins of this railway, it was always seen as an economic regeneration project after you know continuing decline in the textiles industry, the, the closure of the two via systems plants. This was all about economic regeneration. And the railway will give people opportunities to access new work, uh, new education opportunities in Midlothian and Edinburgh, and that will encourage more people to stay in the borders rather than leaving the borders to live and work elsewhere. And I think also, interestingly, despite the fact it was almost completely ignored in the original Scott Wilson feasibility study, is that tourism is going to be a big part of this railway. Now that's something that campaigners realised very, very on, very, very early on, long before the promoters had got a handle on all this. So we've got a railway that will take you down, for example, adjacent to the National Mining Museum at Newton Grange Station. We'll then take you on to Tweed Bank, only a mile from Sir Walter Scott's Abbotsford. We'll have the Great Tapestry of Scotland, almost adjacent to the station. Melrose is just a couple of miles down the road. And we'll see integrated tickets for train, plus connecting bus, plus entrance to these visitor centres. And I think that's going to bring an enormous number of people in from Edinburgh. Think of all the tourists who are in Edinburgh looking for something different to do. And there's a train that can take you in less than an hour down to the heart of the borders and you have a really nice day out in a civilised form of transport. So I think that will work really well too. So we are going to see a transformation. It will change the borders, it's certainly changing the transport, and it will open up all kinds of opportunities that haven't been there for the last 45 years. Well, the whole issue of the way Gala Shields has been developed, everybody's got their own views of that. You know, the big supermarkets coming in and taking development away from the, the town centre. But to be fair, the new transport interchange that Scottish Borders Council are building in the centre of Gala, part of the idea of that is to pull the emphasis back towards the centre of Gala again. So you've, you've got this... Some people might not find it an attractive building, but it's a building that will be very capable. It will have the bus stances. You'll have information about bus and rail. Only a short walk across the A7 on a, a colour light crossing uh, to the railway station for the interchange with the railway. And as a result of campaigners' efforts, people will not have to wait more than 30 seconds to cross the road, whereas previously it was going to be 90 seconds. So I think we'll see a shift of emphasis in Galashiels back towards the centre and with the railway and the linked bus services spreading across the borders from there, very much part of that equation.
It is a real pleasure and I feel greatly honoured to name this locomotive Marge Elliott MBE. All the more so as her purpose in life is the creation of railways, not their destruction. I wish my namesake a prosperous, track-laying future which will bring joy and comfort to countless travellers. Thank you. Well, today marks uh, really the completion of construction work in the Borders Railway. And we felt it was appropriate to, to mark that by honouring some of the people who have campaigned over the years to bring the railway back to life. And no one came to mind more strongly than Madge Elliott. Her involvement goes right back to the closure of the line in 1969. She's campaigned actively for bringing the line back to the borders. So it was great to have the chance to name this locomotive after her today. Quite honestly, I feel a wee bit flabbergasted at <laughs> this happening. Yes, it's uh, what an honour, really. I yes. suppose it marks the passing of time and, and your efforts over so many years to get us to where we are today, but also this is a sign of what is still to come, I suppose, with the first trains about to start running down the, the new line. Yes, yes. I, I'm pleased for the border folk, really, to, to be able to say that they can get onto a train again and into the city. You know, yeah, and it takes you into central Edinburgh. It's not as if they're going to have to look for a, 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 par, a car park, you know, if they come by train. Does your work stop here, though? Because it goes down as far as Tweed Bank, and I know you'd be very passionate to see it heading down to Hoyk and further down to Carlisle to replace what, what used to be there. Well, as I always say, if the Hoyk folk want it, they'll have to get up and shout for it. They'll have to do something about it themselves. Yes. Um, they're, they're kind of bad for saying everything goes to Galway. Well, it's up to them to fight for the train if they wanted to come to Hoyk. Kim, I mean, this is a hugely proud moment for you yourself as well. And I mean, the Waverley line means a, as much to you as it does for yeah. your mum because it, it, in some ways, brought you both to very much together. Yeah. The late 60s and the early 70s, I was certainly an, a railway enthusiast and I got about a bit. Uh, I learned to tell the time before I went to primary school with the trains because we lived quite close to the, the, the railway line going south from Hoyk up the gradient and we had the steam trains going up the gradient, pulling freight trains and quite often there was a banker in the back so I, you know, I, I learned to tell the time and you know, it, it's been quite a, a significant thing in my life, yeah. Today has been a case of your, or an opportunity to reflect on the past, but very much a forward-thinking feeling in oh, the station today. A doubt. Yes, yes. I mean, the, I'm sure the, the border folk will take great advantage of the of the, the transport that's being provided by rail. Yes, I mean, to travel by road nowadays, by car, you know, it's parking spaces, whereas come by rail, you're into central Edinburgh. It's wonderful. <laughs>